Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. I, I don't have any answers. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, going to uh, uh, cover what some of the problems are. Uh, so my, uh, I'd like my authors and fellow authors, and I would like to thank some of the graduate students who have uh, contributed to all this information we have over the, over the years. So I have an objective and a purpose. Um, <clears throat> the objective was to uh, uh, just review the properties of our uh, fluid fine tailings that are having a, either a, a negative or a positive influence on the consolidation of the material. And uh, uh, I start the paper off by uh, reminding everyone that we started making fluid fine tailings uh, some 45 years ago uh, when the Great Canadian Oil Sands Company uh, first started uh, producing uh, uh, tailings. Uh, it was now Suncor, of course. And, um, uh, and then I go on to uh, point out that, the, uh, of course, everyone is quite familiar with uh, the ERCB Directive uh, 074, which uh, uh, was developed in conjunction with the oil sand companies. So there's no surprise to them what the uh, regulations uh, are. And um, we now have, uh, of course, it's been pointed out by a number of people, a vast volume of fluid fine tailings covering a great area uh, that exists right now. And uh, uh, so the question is why, at this stage of the game, uh, are, are, haven't we solved the problem of fluid fine, oil sand and fluid fine tailings and consolidate them and dispose of them like we have with may, many other types of, of, of tailings? Well, uh, the interesting part about it is that the ERCB came out with a report in June this year which took a look at how the companies are measuring up to the uh, Directive 074. Uh, there are four companies which have to report at the present time, and um, uh, the RCB report uh, uh, listed how they had done in, in the year 2011-2012 uh, uh, and 2012 to 2013, no, uh, uh, 2010 to 2011 <laughs> and 2011 to 2012. And this last year, uh, the four companies that uh, reported uh, they, uh, had, they reported how much, what percent of the uh, fluid of the fines they had to capture in dedicated disposal areas. And, uh, uh, and of course, by ERCB directive, there was a certain percentage they had to capture. Well, the amount they captured varied from zero to 73% of what they were required to do. Uh, both the RCB and the companies have been very surprised at this, and they said, well, we were very optimistic on, uh, when we set these regulations up. Uh, to be fair about it, the zero uh, that some company uh, was uh, uh, saddled with was because actually their way of measuring the uh, disposal of fines wasn't what the RCB wanted, so it wasn't counted. Uh, and two of the other companies, uh, well, the other companies also they had uh, um, uh, technical problems with equipment, uh, but also two of them depended on surface drying. And unfortunately, the weather didn't cooperate. That's one of the problems with surface drying. Mother Nature often doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Uh, so that's, that's, that, that's the situation right now. Um, uh, one of the things I didn't mention uh, in the paper, and was mentioned in the, in the uh, uh, introduction here, that I have uh, actually been working in oil sands for for uh, 39 years, almost as long, and I don't have a silver bullet either. Um, so I would like to go uh, ahead and take a look at some of the uh, things uh, that we looked at. Uh, in the paper, I discussed all these properties. I don't have time to do them all right now, so I'm just going to discuss about the oil sands or and tailing stream and, and the biogenic gas and thixometry and overconsolidation. consolidation uh, This is a why I want to look at oil sands ore, because there's a good picture of me in 1974. <laughs> uh, this is a, a scraper pit in, at, in the Syncrude site during the uh, design and construction of Syncrude. And uh, many people don't realize that they had uh, attempted to excavate the oil sands for the plant uh, using a scraper and pull, push dozers. Uh, but the point is I wanted to look at was the um, uh, th th that the, uh, uh, that here you can see the black oil sands and you see the lightly colored clay shale layers. And it's these clay shale layers which are very intermittent in different thicknesses which provide all the fines uh, uh, for the uh, 
uh, plant. And when you take a look at the grain size curves, you notice that the oil sands proper, that's the dark material, has very few fines, maybe one or two percent fines. The clay shale layers are almost all a hundred percent fines. And uh, these are uh, rather uh, weak clay shale layers which are broken up easily. So in the mining they get broken up and in the extraction process they get broken up a little more and uh, the sodium hydroxide being added to the extraction process disperses the clays even more and the tailing stream ends up with what you see. Now that's only about 17% finds the tailing stream and that will vary greatly depending on the uh, amount of uh, uh, of clay shale layers that are incorporated at the particular time in the tailings. So that's, that, that's a problem. A lot of people will talk about selective mining, which would be very good to uh, not, uh, if you're going to mine uh, a clay shale layer, or with a lot of clay shale layers, then maybe you should treat that separately. Uh, but anyway, that's a, uh, another thought. Uh, the, one of the things that uh, really uh, bothers me is the lack of interest in, in biogenic gas. Uh, this is a picture at Syncrude around uh, 2000, and those are gas bubbles coming out. Uh, this is the uh, Middle Lake tailings pond. Those are gas bubbles uh, coming out of the uh, out of the fluid fine tailings, uh, mainly methane, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and uh, this gas. Uh, didn't start coming out right away around 1995, it started coming out. And over the exceeding five years, there was quite a change, increase in solids content near the surface of the MFT. Uh, my take on that is that the gas bubbles uh, bubble up and you have a, a soil with a void ratio of five or four, the particles can move sideways as well as vertically. And uh, so the gas bubbles force channels up through the MFT and water follows those channels and the uh, uh, solids content increases. Now, an increase in solids content doesn't mean that the uh, material is uh, consolidating. Uh, you must remember that if there's gas bubbles in there, uh, you really need to know the density too. So everybody reports solids content, but they tend to ignore what the gas bubbles are doing. That's something I think has to be, when you're studying MFT or fluid fine tailings, you've got to check for gas bubbles or uh, pro uh, production of gas bubbles. Uh, the other thing I mentioned is the thixotropic strength. Uh, this is a, a plot of a, a testing to measure thixotropic strength. It went up to 450 days, and you'll notice, obviously, it increased and, and uh, lower the void ratio. Uh, it increased even faster, the thixotropic strength. So it's both uh, time and void ratio dependent on what you get. Uh, these are the 10 meter columns I mentioned. There's two columns and uh, when you look at the right hand one, there's a technician star standing down there which you can see the size of them. Uh, so these uh, 10 meter columns were, were filled with uh, uh, MFT, uh, but a solids content of uh, 30%. And um, uh, uh, we monitored them from the original date of 1982 when they filled up to 2012 when we had to dismantle them. Uh, so this is the interface settlement of the MFT in the standpipe. And you can see at 30 years it had settled uh, 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 over three and a half, uh, half meters. And um, uh, so, uh, uh, especially during the first 10 years, uh, this is not consolidation. We, as we'll show, this was really a creep phenomenon going on. And uh, the rate of creep is very important. And of course, for a material to creep like that, the water has to get out. So uh, uh, the hydraulic conductivity is important and the length of drainage path is also important. So when we do uh, small samples in the large strain consolidation test, we have a very small distance and the creep rate will be much faster. Uh, unfortunately, the creep rate also tends to destroy the uh, bonding or the uh, uh, thixotrophic strength. So when we do a small test, we may not have the same thixotrophic strength that we have in, in the field. Uh, just as a point, this is the first 900 days. The top plot shows the settlement of the interface going on, and the bottom plot, I just showed one depth here. We measure, were measuring excess pore pressures at 11 different depths, and they all showed the same thing. In the first uh, about 80 days or so, 70, 80 days, the pore pressures, excess pore pressures dropped about 2 kPa. There was a slight increase after that, and then a long-term 
uh, 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 drop in excess bar pressure. That long term is not uh, consolidation, it's because actually the interface is going down too, and therefore the total stress is decreasing, and the pore pressures just react, uh, uh, decreasing pore pressures are reacting to the decrease in, in, uh, in, in total stress. So uh, looking at the 78 days, I've plotted here, I won't go into it, uh, uh, the, there's the uh, excess pore pressures and what we're calling the modified total stress. I've just subtracted the hydrostatic uh, water pressure from the total pore pressure and the total uh, stress. But it's still the difference between the uh, modified total stress and excess pore pressure, which is the, the um, uh, effective stress. And you can see that over the full, in the first 78 days, over the full height of the standpipe, a 1 to 2 kPa effective stress developed. And we attribute this to uh, the uh, uh, overconsolidation or the fixotropic strength uh, developing an overconsolidation. Uh, this should not be a surprise. We always, from day one, everybody said, oh, this material has got a gel strength. Well, that, of course, is our fixotropic strength developing. Um, uh, we go on to 10 years, and we see that uh, there is a little bit of consolidation. We're up to 5 kPa effective stress at the bottom, but we still have 1 or 2 kPa in, in the top part. And when we go on to the last one, uh, the 30-year, uh, we see about the bottom uh, at 2 meters is showing some consolidation. At the very bottom, it's about 7 kPa, but it's, as you can see, it's got to get up to about... 21 kPa for full dissipation. Uh, the top uh, um, uh, four meters is still showing this one or two kPa thixotropic strength. And uh, so that's sort of the action of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the 10 meter standpipe. And so I chose a few summary points, conclusions out of the paper. Uh, one is that, uh, of course, we know that the properties, uh, they vary due to the uh, mineralogy and uh, water chemistry and also the influence of the bitumen, but the interaction between all these things we do not understand very well yet. And uh, I mentioned again about dispersed fines are mainly coming from the clay shale layers. And the last two is the biogenic gas, which I really think that has to be studied a lot more. I know I, when graduate students bring in a sample of MFT from a company somewhere, I say, is there any gas in it, any gas bubbles in it, or are there any gas bubbles going to generate in it? And all I get back is they are blank looks. No one has even considered it. Everybody talks about solids content. Solids content won't tell you if there's gas there or not, of course. You also have to measure density. And very few companies are measuring density in their tanning spawn. Uh, and of course, the other uh, conclusion I thought was interesting is about the um, uh, 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 about the thixotropic strength over consolidating the material. I mean, it's not going to consolidate until uh, the effective stress gets over the over consolidation stress by uh, thixotropic strength, it'll start to consolidate. And um, uh, as I mentioned, I don't think our, even our thixotropic strength in the, in the uh, uh, 10 meter standpipe is probably as much as occurs in the tailings pond where it doesn't creep so fast. And especially, people then do a large strain test to get MFT. They mix it up thoroughly, destroying all the thixotropic strength they can, and then they maybe load it up high enough that they can overcome the uh, over consolidation stress right away. Unfortunately, in the, uh, uh, it's very difficult to add a, a high load on the fluid fine tailings in the field. It's just, just too weak to take a load. So I think people really have to start back and look at all the very, very low stresses and how it will uh, um, uh, creep away at the beginning in a large drain test, which may take a number of months, even to, under self-weight. Uh, we put a sample in and we generally, uh, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters high, measure pore pressures at the bottom. And over three months, it'll, the surface will go down a lot, but the pore pressures at the bottom won't dissipate. Uh, so that's what's happening to the MFT in the field as well. Thank you very much.